Hello and welcome to this India Today special, Royal Stag Barrel Select Perfect Strokes, where we explore perfection in sport with true sporting legends. It's a great privilege to be joined by four of the iconic sports persons of recent times. A.B. De Villiers, champion batsman, someone who's rewritten the rules of cricket over the years. Gary Kasparov, the unarguably the greatest chess player the world has ever seen. Mo Farah, winner of four Olympic golds and doing that remarkable double of 5,000 and 10,000 in two consecutive Olympics. And Rick Charlesworth, champion coach, as well as a world champion in hockey with Australia. And dare I remind you also a first class cricketer and a medical doctor. Wonderful to have four of you together. Thank you very much. Let's talk, talk about perfection. Dr. Charlesworth, what makes perfection in sport? I think that uh, to, be really, to be really, really good is what we all aim for. And as a coach, I uh, coached many, many players in our national team. I never met one who knew how good he could be. And so it's aspiring to be the best that you can possibly be. It's, it's about uh, lifting the bar and, and uh, lifting your horizons. And uh, then it's about lots and lots of uh, preparation and practice. Uh, you, you, you win the Olympic gold medal in the year before the Olympics. And uh, you win the major competitions uh, uh, by how well you prepare. But is there anything like the perfect sports person? Can you say that A is, the, is an example of perfection in sport? Is there anything like perfection, A.B. de Villiers in sport? Because you are one of those cricketers who keep kept changing the boundaries of what was possible on a cricket field. No, there's, there's certainly nothing, well, no such thing as a perfect sportsman, I, I believe. I was, I was hoping you wouldn't ask me that. While, while Rick was talking, I was sitting here <laughs> thinking, what am I going to say if you ask me that question? <laughs> um, f I, all I can tell you is, personally for me, it's, it's a deep desire. Um, it's, a, it's from a very young age, know, knowing where you're going, um, having that goal in mind, wanting to, to be the best in the world and the best there has ever been. And then that's, that's what drives you day in and day out, out, day in and day out. And it's constant pressure, constantly things change. But if you have that desire and that end goal in mind all the time, um, you've got a good chance to get there. But there are lots of people who have the desire. Thousands <laughs> and thousands of people play cricket, chess, athletics, hockey. But only one makes it to the top. So, you know, is perfection about reaching the Mount Everest of your sport? As you did. You may say so, because in the, in the long history of the world championship title started in 1886, there were only 16 world champions. That tells you that, you know, it's an accomplishment of its own just to, to climb to the top. And then the next challenge is to stay on the top. And uh, I think the perfection, uh, which is not achievable in human games, actually it's not achievable even for computers, because... 100% uh, perfection is, is, doesn't exist in the universe. But it's our desire, our determination actually to be perfect. It's our drive to, uh, and our readiness to actually find out our own mistakes, to be very you know, uh, blunt and even relentless analyzing our own games and coming up every, every day, every new day with new ideas and with this never-ending quest for perfection. The never-ending quest for perfection is, the, is that passion then. In, in, in what I'm hearing, I see one word which has not yet been used, which is passion. This intense desire that G Gary just spoke about to be the best you can be. Not necessarily the best of all time, mm -hmm. but the best that you can be. Yeah, it's about being the best that you can be. It's been able to be a ruthless and make that decision and being able to be better than others. And that's how you get a perfect run, as it, I guess. Being able to do better than others. Because, you know, on the track or, or on the cricket pitch, it's, it's so many guys. And being able to do better than them people puts you in a better position. And then being able to hold that with the pressure will come with a lot of stuff. And doing it better than anyone else. And that's what gets you to that. You know, in any sport, to be at the top for as long as, let's say, Kasparov was for two decades, Mo Farah winning two uh, World Cups, A.B. de Villiers more than a decade at the top. What does it take as a coach to ensure that that player can stay at the top, not just reach number one, but stay there? Well, as I said, the, the, the coach's role is to keep lifting the bar, but the athlete has to want to do that too. And in the end, what you're looking for is reproducible skill under pressure. 
and reproducible skill under pressure comes from playing against people who are better than you, are harder than you. So as a coach, what do I do? Then I make training harder than the match. I, uh, I outnumber one team. I, I give you a smaller area in which to play. I make difficult decisions from the referee. There's all sorts of ways in which I can make training difficult. And, and that's what I do. What does Mo do? He, 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 won, he gives himself a handicap at training, I suspect. Or he has to work harder than somebody else does. And, uh, the, you know, maybe you bet uh, against the bowlers bowling 18 yards rather than 20. You know, there's all sorts of ways in which you can do that. Gary played against uh, the, the difficult computer. <laughs> and, and indeed, there's all sorts of ways in which you can challenge yourself to do that. If, but if but you, you, made a, you made a reference to handling pressure. And I just wonder, you know, for, from the outside, when I look at you batting, let's say, you seem to sort of almost revel in the pressure. You almost seem to sort of, uh, you know, enjoy the idea of being put under pressure to produce a great innings. Is that part of perfection to, you know, to put yourself in a situation where you don't feel the pressure? Do you feel the pressure or not? As De a legend. Definitely. I, I won't say, I, I don't know if, I can't speak on behalf of other people, but I was certainly not born mentally tough, that's for sure. I had to, I had to learn how to survive under pressure. I had to learn from my mistakes, have a look at my trades. Where do I, where are my weaknesses when I'm feeling a bit of, bit of the heat? Um, but um, once you get to know your game, you get to a certain stage and you understand your game so well, then that pressure situation has become a big opportunity to, to create and to, to innovate and to be different. Practice makes perfect. Is it about practicing exactly what moves my rival will make on a chessboard, preparing in advance much more than anyone else? I found out that it's quite a paradox either during my preparation because it was not very often when your preparation uh, uh, could actually lead to an immediate victory. So sometimes, you know, it worked. But in many cases, you know, the game uh, could take a different path and, uh, and uh, you could hardly envision the scenario. But somehow, again, mysteriously, the amount of work you do at home even if, it's not, if it doesn't materialize on board, helps you in a cr crucial moment to find the right move. Again, I don't know what is the connection, but I, I, I can definitely tell you the quality preparation at home somehow manifests during the game, even if the game takes a different path. Uh, you came as an eight-year-old from Mogadishu. This is a story that is now told again and again. And I just wonder whether the circumstances from where you come mm -hmm. make you a little bit more hungry than, let's say, someone who's had a relaxed life in London and doesn't have to work or doesn't feel the urge to work that hard? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, from what I know as an eight-year-old and what my 13-year-old now, my oldest girl knows, and I've, I've got four kids, so you look at them and it's different. And for me, I think what makes me is who I am and makes me fight more than anyone else is being able to be you know, open to you know, growing up in Africa, not having much. That was, I think, part of me to make me stronger and to appreciate and to understand of hard work. As you said, most people would have gone, yes, I can't speak any English, I can't do many things. And rules are the self. I, I never did that. I was one of these people where, you know, being at school was fun. Being able to mix with other kids, being able to play a game of football, being able to just be hyperactive and crazy and going for a walk, that was part of school. And at the same time, I think it made me kind of understand of life. And, I, and at that point, I obviously, I worked hard and got into the athletics track and, and, you know, visiting all around the world, going different countries. And it came to a point in my career where, you know, go to uni, you have a laugh, but you have to make that decision yourself. What do you want? Do you want it or not? And most of the people, there's a lot of people, as you said, AB said, has, has talent has probably more talent than me, but are they willing to work hard? Are they willing to put the work in? And as we said, if we put the work in and work hard, then it's possible. Each one of us wouldn't be where we are now, sitting here in front of each other, if we didn't commit and make that work and, you know, make that happen. Nobody made it happen. We had to obviously do something and work towards that. Is it about keeping sports simple? You know, the great, the great legends in their respective sports seem to keep it very simple. Is there something about that, that they don't complicate the world too much? They, they do it because there is a particular way of playing their sport. They don't overthink, over uh, complicate the sport. I don't know how to apply this concept of oversimplification to the game of chess. Some of the games are very complicated, uh, even for professionals to understand. So, um, 
No, I, 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 I think it's just it's 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 more about the attitude of a chess player. It's just it's. I saw big crowd, so a couple of thousand people in the audience following the rapid chess games, understanding a little, but then I heard people saying, you know, we were mesmerized by, by the spirit because they could feel that this, something is happening. And even some very you know, brisk commentaries uh, 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 in, in just that, that they, they could hear in their earphones, it was enough for them just to, be, to become part of the show. So it's, it's you know, Somehow it's, it's, it's an energy, so that is, that's, that is just, uh, that is being uh, generated by the players and that's, they create, they create something that people can, can, can remember even without understanding the, the, the nuances of the game. One is keeping the sport simple, the other is handling pressure. You're at the 2012 Olympics, it's London, the host country, everyone expects you to win. Does that make it easier for you or more difficult? As you said, each athlete is different, as AB said. You know, it's being able to use that, getting the best out of yourself. And I knew in myself, um, obviously, I knew there was a pressure and I could feel the pressure. But it's a way of you to think, oh my God, so much pressure, I can't get this wrong. Is this, it, it, I didn't think to doubt myself. It was more thinking, how can I use this to get the best out of myself? And I used that in a way that motivated me more. It's more of a thinking, this is my country. The people want me to do well. This is it. This is, you know, so, so many people are here for me. I'm trying to use that, the noise, the support, and think more of a positive thing. And that's what I did. And because there is the danger of choking. You know, we keep hearing this. I, I, I'm not asking this to the South Africans when yeah. it comes to the World Cup because they've been often accused of this, of choking on the big occasion. But the Australians were also in hockey for a long time in the Olympics. Why aren't you winning a gold? Do they choke at the big moment, don't produce their best? Is that fair to ask top-class sportsmen, are you choking in a big sport? Well, it's a real thing. It happens. And uh, I, I, I can imagine, like, the... In your team doesn't play well unless they has, have intensity. You have to have intensity. And I think that's uh, what uh, Gary's talking about. And uh, concentration is critical. But the first rule of sports psychology is you focus on the process, the outcome will look after itself. And, and that's what athletes learn to do. And we had a home Olympics too and great expectations. And one of our great runners, Kathy Freeman, yep. with a stadium 400. full of Australians expecting her yep. to win, uh, had, had to go out there and do that. That, that, that's intense pressure. The secret is to be able to, to focus on the process. The, the outcome looks after itself. Focus on the process, not on the outcome. But is that easier for an individual sportsman than a team sports? At the end of the day, you are one of 11. I mean, to win an, a World Cup, let's say, all 11 perhaps need to perform at a certain level. Do you believe in a team sport, it becomes that much more difficult for you to to get everyone to raise their bar to achieve that level of perfection. You might do it. What about the other ten? That's complicated. Uh, he's the it's master. E he's the I, I, I'm trying to find. I'm trying to find an explanation, uh, Ab, for you know, for this whole question of why does South Africa not win the World Cup? Is it fair to put the blame on one player, two players? Is it at the end of the day, can an entire team choke on the big occasion? I think you can stiffen up a bit. Um, we've certainly felt the pressure as a team, but all teams have felt that pressure before. Um, it's, I, I think that's where your leaders stand up, your experienced players, um, lead from the front, guys who speak calmly, who seem to be acting the same. Like you said earlier, I seem to be so chilled under pressure, but actually I'm feeling the heat, but I know how important it is for me to show to the rest of the team, especially some of the youngsters, that I'm calm, under control, because one of them might just use that kind of energy and go and win the game for us. So personally for me, I've never choked. I've, I've felt pressure. I've seen it as opportunity. I've failed sometimes. I've learned from my mistakes. I've moved on. I've performed under pressure. So um, the, the, the fact that we haven't won a World Cup, it's one of those things. It's sport. It's part of, part of the game. I'm sure the team will, will pull it off soon. Stay calm is a word that was just used. I mean, in a chess, on a chess board, one move, <laughs> you know, like on a cricket field or indeed in any sport, could make all the difference between victory and defeat. How do you then stay calm and ensure that you're achieving the level of perfection that you want? 
amidst all that intense pressure. When are you saying stay calm? What does it mean? You look, you know, uh, uh, indifferent, so you have your poker face. I don't. So uh, I think oh, very often people, they, they, they make a mistake mixing uh, self-expression, the character, with the ability to survive under pressure. I mean, Karpov was just, you know, was, was is much uh, calmer as a person. So, and if you look at two of us, you say he would survive under pressure better than Gary Kasparov, but I won all the decisive games. Because it's not about you being emotional, but it's about your, your brains working clockwise. So just, yes, you know this is a moment, and this is, again, I cannot explain it. It's, it's maybe, it's, it's also some sort of mythology, but, but it's, it's every, every uh, cell of your brains, you know, every part of your body actually works for this, for this very moment. It's also, you have to feel it. This is like a climax. So I know this is the moment where I have to, okay, not 100%, but as close to 100% as I can mobilize. And again, very, very few people can feel this moment. So that's just, because it's, it's not every, every moment of the game. So this is, this is the moment where I have to mobilize everything I have. And this is a decisive moment of the race, of the match, of, of, the, of the cricket game, whatever. This is the time where I win this moment, I, or I, get an, I can get an advantage throughout this very short moment, and it will have a decisive effect for the rest of the match. Is that something intuitive? Is that something spontaneous that comes in? This is the moment where I'm going to, in, in a 10,000 meter race, make my, uh, make my move. Is that intuitive? Is that come to, through practice? Is that God-given? It's being able to, as Gary said, being able to feel, being able to work it out and make that move and make that right move. Many athletes or many chess players had to make that move or you want them to make a move and you want them to do it and then you, you go around them. But it's being able to, you know, control it and making that move where you actually feel this is it, boom, and decisive move. Where does that come from? I'm just wondering where does that come from? Is there, is there some gene inside there which tells you, this is the moment I've got to strike. I mean, the great sports persons know how to choose their moves, their moments. Yeah, and, and often, you know, you make that move, and obviously, you, as he says, it's about having perfect run. That's, you that's, can that's, make that's, mistakes. That's, that's you why do. You have only one winner. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's it. Because you can feel this do. very moment. Yeah. So, and others cannot. And often, you know, from the beginning, it was never like that. And that's why it's taken me a while to be able to work down making that. I've gone before, felt like this is the right move. Got it wrong. Put your hand up. Get over it. Boom. Next one. And try not make make the same mistake. That's a good point on which to end. But I, I want to end with you, uh, Dr. Uh, yes, go ahead. Well, yeah. I th see. I think th there is a difference between the individual sport and the team sport. And it's easier and it's harder because other people in your team can mess up, and that can <laughs> that can hurt. I, in an individual sport, you're really responsible. My my concern is that even you're making an ordinary move in chess. If you make a silly move, then that can hurt you. It might not be the great moment of the game, but that, that mistake that you make can hurt you. My, my understanding, no one scored a goal against our team unless we get four or five things consecutively wrong. This person did make a good tackle. He was out of position. That didn't happen. This is goal shot. Same if we wanted to score a goal, we had to get four or five things consecutively right. So a single incident determination is what you need. You, all of those, every incident of the game is important and the, 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 the concentration required to play seven or eight hours of chess is enormous, I can imagine. We only have to play for an hour or so. You know, sometimes you play a long innings. You know, yeah, that, and, and you are the last no. line of defense. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, but I, uh, every you know, time. <laughs> let, let me end by asking you this. Can the perfect sports person afford to make the same mistake again? No. Is that perhaps the skill of a perfect sports person? Once he's made a mistake, he's very unlikely to repeat it. Would that be a fair way to look at perfection again? That the really great perfect sports person doesn't repeat his mistakes or learns from his mistakes. Let's put it that way. And I don't think you can become good unless you make a number of mistakes. And it's your mistakes that make you good. And, and uh, learning from them is, is, is a critical part of it. The mistakes are your friends. I just want to add to something Gary said earlier and that, that hit home with me quite, quite very, very well. For a year or so in my cricketing career, I tried to be like Jack Ellis because he seemed to be the guy who can handle pressure. So mm -hmm. calm, never try to do something funny out there. So I try to play like that, like, ooh, look calm, <laughs> ice cold. But I'm, I'm 10 out of 10 when I've got intensity, when I'm running and I'm, I'm making eye contact and I'm sort of jumping out of my skin. 
but that's the way I play. When I try and play something like someone else, when I try to be calm and relaxed like my opponent, I'm a five out of tenner. So it's just being true to yourself and then learning from your mistakes. But I'm an intense guy under pressure, and that's what makes me good. Let's uh, end this first part of this special show here because it means that one size doesn't fit all. You can have a Bjorn Borg and a John McEnroe. You can have a Gary Kasparov and a Karpov. You can have a Mo Farah and a Lassie Viren. And you can have Rick Charlesworth and all the great hockey players of the modern era as well. It's been a pleasure talking to you, but we've got more with these greats. Remember, this is only the first episode of this special Royal Stag, Barrel Select, Perfect Strokes. What makes a perfect sports person? In part two, we look for personal role models that these great sports persons have had and ask them to share their real life experiences. Thanks very much for watching. Goodbye.